Ramesh, Distinguished Vice Chancellor of Kakatiya University, Professor Keshavan Velutat, outgoing President of the Indian History Congress, Professor Aditya Mukherjee, the incoming President of the Indian History Congress, Professor K. M. Srimali, former President of the Indian History Congress, Professor Nadeem Rezavi, the Secretary of the Indian History Congress, Professor T. Srinivas Rao, Registrar, Kakatiya University, Professor T. Manohar, Local Secretary, Indian History Congress, all the sectional presidents, distinguished members of the Executive Committee, and my fellow teachers and dear students. I'm deeply honored to be invited to be the chief guest to address the 82nd session of the Indian History Congress at the historic town of Warangal, originally known as Urugalu, of the Kakatiya Kingdom, the capital of the Kakatiya Kingdom. As you all know, the Kakatiya dynasty, which ruled the areas of the Eastern Deccan from the early 12th to the mid 14th century, was the harbinger of important achievements in the areas of art, architecture, sculpture, literature, and language to the region. Warangal itself is the site of many of its great marvels, the fort, the Thousand Pillar Temple, the nearby Ramappa Temple, and much else, which you must see before you leave if you haven't seen it already. This period also saw the flowering of the Telugu language, which gave the region its identity in the long run. Some of the earliest inscriptions in the Telugu language are to be found in this period. It also gave us a famous woman queen in the 13th century, Rudrama Devi, who was reputed to be a very fine and capable ruler. This region then also acquired another distinct identity when the Nizam founded the autonomous state of Hyderabad in 1824, which lasted till 1948. This phase of the region's history led to the evolution of multi-religious, multilingual cultural traditions, giving the region a distinct character. Telugu, Marathi, Kannada, and Urdu coexisted and influenced each other in myriad ways. This region then was also at the heart of the famous anti-Nizam struggle for liberation and integration with the Indian Union in the years 1946 to 48, and the peasant struggle led by the communists, which flowed out of it. This, to add a personal note at this point, a team of us led by Professor Bipin Chandra, which included myself and Professor Aditya Mukherjee, came to Warangal in 1984, almost 40 years ago, as part of a project to collect the oral history of the participants in the freedom struggle. We were helped by a large number of people from within Andhra, now Telangana, especially Professor Shanta Sinha of Central University Hyderabad, who is also here in the audience today, Professor J.P. Rao of Usmania University and Nizam College, who's also here today, and who belongs to Warangal, and many others. We conducted a large number of interviews of participants belonging to all political streams, Gandhian, socialists, communists, what have you, from top leaders like Ravinarayan Reddy to D.V. Rao, Arutla Ramchandra Reddy, who accompanied us on this tour in this area, to village-level Dalam members, including many brave women fighters. This gave us the opportunity to get to know the wonderful people of this state, enjoy their generous hospitality, partake of their delic delicious cuisine, and record their saga of struggle and sacrifice and heroism. Since then, 
we have felt a special affinity with this land and its people. And therefore, we welcome this opportunity to renew our acquaintance with it. The Indian History Congress, as you know, is the largest and the oldest organization in the country of professional historians and has played a crucial role and has a crucial role to play at this important turning point in the life of our nation. We are all aware of the grave challenge faced by the secure democratic edifice built in independent India on the foundations laid deep by our epic struggle for freedom. The cherished values of equity, equality, justice, secularism, humanism, democracy, and civil liberties, and much else, embodied in the Constitution are being questioned by those who never had any faith in them in the first place or any role in their evolution. An aggressive and regressive, hate-filled, hegemonic nationalism is being imported and substituted for our own homegrown, indigenous, humane, non-homogenizing, progressive nationalism bequeathed to us by Dadabhai Naroji, Sarojini Naidu, Bipin Chandrapal, who, by the way, coined the term of composite nationalism, Rajaji, Mahatma Gandhi, Maulana Azad, Jawaharlal Nehru, and many others. And in the process, what we see is a misuse of history, where a certain imagined and fanciful and often distorted and biased version of history is used to justify what are essentially contemporary ideological and political projects. This Congress, therefore, faces the difficult task of giving leadership to and providing a platform for resistance to these attempts. Indian historians have no choice but to stand up to what is, in essence, an assault on the very discipline of history. With these words, I have to once again thank the organizers of the Congress, the Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, the Local Secretary, the Secretary of the Indian History Congress, for giving me this honor and opportunity to be a part of this historic occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Mridullah Mukherjee, uh, for your address as the chief guest. Incidentally, if uh, uh, our members remember, after a long time, we had an academic as the chief guest instead of a politician. So I think uh, that is something good, which the vice chancellor himself decided to invite uh, Madam here. And I am really thankful to him that instead of politicians, we have an academic between us. Uh, uh, I, but we are hoping that uh, on the last day, we, we might have the Deputy Chief Minister uh, of Telangana. He, he, I am told, is going to join us uh, in a valedictory se uh, session. Uh, now, let me invite Professor Aditya Mukherjee. We are really waiting to hear you, sir. The Vice Chancellor, Professor T. Ramesh, distinguished members on the stage and in the audience, which include my friends and comrades like Professor Shanta Sinha. I'm thankful to the Executive Council of the Indian History Congress for electing me as the general president this year. I'm deeply honored to be presiding over this august body, the largest and most representative organization of historians in India which was created 
during the heyday of the Indian national movement in the mid-1930s. In conformity with the values of the national liberation struggle, symbolized as the idea of India, the Indian History Congress has spearheaded the promotion of scientific, secular, and anti-imperialist history. As all of you are aware, the idea of India is deeply threatened today, and the discipline of history is being mauled beyond recognition and weaponized to destroy the idea of India by religious communal forces, which not only did not participate in India's freedom struggle, but indeed collaborated with imperialism. It is perhaps appropriate that on his 60th death anniversary, I should focus my address on what we can learn from Jawaharlal Nehru. The title of my address is Jawaharlal Nehru uh, in our past, present, and future. Uh, Nehru was among the foremost champions of the idea of India, as well as of a scientific and meaningful history. I believe much can be learned from him to explain our present and chart out a vision of the future. From every speech that you heard today, beginning with that of the Vice Chancellor, you will see presently how much we have actually appropriated from what Jawaharlal Nehru said about history and what one should do with the discipline of history. It is because of what Nehru stood for that he is demonized today, blatantly by communal forces. All kinds of lies, abuse are spread about him using the massive propaganda machinery of the communal forces. Nehru is blamed for all of India's problems, from the partition of the country, the Pakistan problem, the China problem, the crisis in Indian agriculture, the Kashmir issue, crisis in education system, the persistence of poverty, the growing religious polarization in recent years, amending the constitution to curb democracy. Name any problem and you find, they say, Jawaharlal Nehru is responsible. Such is the hatred spread about him that one leader of the current ruling party went to the extent of saying that Nathuram Godse should have aimed his gun at Nehru. Apart from spreading lies about him, the effort is also to erase his memory from the minds of the Indian people. The iconic Nehru Memorial Museum and Library built on the premises where he lived as the first Prime Minister of India is no more. It has been replaced by an all Prime Minister's Museum, which is absolutely a first in the world. Nobody's ever heard of all Prime Ministers of all Presidents' Museum. And Nehru's uh, role and name is dwarfed in that. The Indian Council of Historical Research, not to be left behind in pushing the current regime's initiatives, recently put up a poster celebrating the 75th year of Indian independence, where the pictures of many freedom fighters were put up, except Jawaharlal Nehru, and in his, in his place, the picture of V.D. Savarkar was added, a person, as you know, who apologized to the British, promising total loyalty. The demonizing of Nehru and the values he stood for could only be done by distorting history. And that is what the communal forces have done. As I am addressing a distinguished gathering of historians, I would like to begin with a brief discussion on Nehru's own attitude to the discipline of history before moving on to a discussion on how Nehru is wrongly demonized by detailing some of his actual contributions to the making of modern India. I do so as I believe that Nehru from the early 1930s itself provided a framework partly demonstrated in his own historical writings 
that was in sharp contrast to the colonial and communal framework. Some of the most distinguished scholars of the country, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, adopted and developed decades later the Nehruvian framework, uh, framework. Even now, I believe, much can be learned from him. While referring to Nehru's outstanding historical works, the three major works very well known, Glimpses of World History, The Autobiography, and The Discovery of India, all written from British jails in the 1930s and 19, between 1930 and 1944, Professor Irfan Habib made a, made a very significant comparison, which will surprise many of you. He compared Nehru's writing to Gramsci's iconic prison notebooks. Professor Habib says, these, pers this, these prison works invite comparison in both quantity and quality with the kind of writing that Antonio Gramsci produced as a communist prisoner in fascist Italy. There are true similarities in that both went to history to find answers to the questions raised in their minds uh, as men of action. As Nehru himself said, I'm quoting him, because fate and circumstances placed me in a position to be an actor in the saga of India, my interest in history became not an academic interest in things of the past, but an intense personal interest. One has to go back to history to understand the present and try to understand what the future ought to be. Habib quoted Marx's famous statement, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it to argue that for a man of action like Nehru, history was not just a directionless descriptive narrative placed in a chronological order, but a resource from which one sought to understand the present in order to try and shape the future. Nehru urged historians to approach history in this manner. For example, just when India was emerging from the Holocaust-like situation caused by communal strife and the partition of the country on that basis, and the newly born Indian state was to embark on the path of building a secular, inclusive country, Nehru tells historians in December 1948 the following. He says, history shows us both the binding process and the disruptive process. Today, a little more obviously. And in any activity that we are indulging in, we have the choice of laying emphasis on the binding and constructive aspects or the other. While exhorting the historians to emphasize the former, in the printed version it is written as latter, please correct it, he warns, true to the rigors of the discipline of history, I'm quoting him, we must not, of course, give way to wishful thinking and emphasize something which we want to emphasize, which has no relation uh, to fact. However, he goes on to say, nevertheless, I think it is possible within the terms of scholarship and precision and truth to emphasize the binding and constructive aspects rather than the other. And I hope the activities of historians will be directed to that end. I'll just take one half of 30 seconds to tell you that there are three major errors in the printed version. One. I just now corrected. It is not latter, but former on page four, line seven. On page 13, uh, last para, first line, there is an additional A which has to be removed. And on page 33, second para, line nine, the, the binary that I talk about is communal versus national, not secular versus national. So please correct those. To return to what I was saying, this that is the emphasis to the, the, uh, the emphasis on the binding and constructive aspect of history is what Nehru himself did brilliantly in his classic work, The Discovery of India. While the colonial and communal approach was to cons constantly try to weaponize any conflict in the past to exacerbate them in the present. 
The colonial communal interpretation, you may note that I use them uh, simultaneously because there is, there is a deep umbilical cord connection between the colonial and the communal. This must, we must remind you of this because the communal now masquerades as the nationalist, but actually they have a deep colonial uh, connection. The colonial communal interpretation repeatedly emphasized the trauma experienced as a result of hindu muslim conflict. These theories, or rather memories, so-called memories of trauma, were often created centuries after the so-called traumatic events. I'll just give you one case in point. A case in point is the alleged trauma felt by Hindus because of the destruction of the Somnath temple by a Muslim invader, the Mahmud of Ghazni. More than a thousand years ago, in 1026, after independence, a demand was made that a great grand temple be constructed in Somnath. K. Munshi claimed in 1951, and I'm quoting him, you will see the contemporary relevance of this. Munshi says, for a thousand years, Mahmud's destruction of the shrine has been burnt into the collective subconscious of the Hindu race hmm? as an unforgettable national disaster. So that this has been uh, uh, burnt into the psyche of the Indian, this humiliation or this destruction of the shrine. In fact, however, there was no evidence of a thousand-year-old trauma. Munshi, unknowingly perhaps, was reflecting the colonial perspective created in the 19th century, nearly 800 years later, because the earliest mention discovered so far of Hindu trauma caused by this Muslim invasion is brought, is, uh, is, uh, occurs in 1843 when it is brought up in the British House of Commons. Colonial historiography since the 19th century has used events like this to evolve a notion of permanent confrontation between the Hindus and Muslims, laying the, fun, the basis of the two-nation theory. The communalists picked up this theme and amplified it. The eminent historian, Professor Romila Thapar, using a multiplicity of sources, has convincingly demonstrated that no such permanent confrontation between Hindus and Muslims occurred historically.